I'd give up my sister to go to heaven. <laughs> now I've got to think of an illustration better than that. So, all right, here we go. That's <laughs> the power tools. God's Word uh, this morning is from Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 31. It's a little bit of a longer passage, so if you'd like to sit, you may. But if you'd like to stand for the reading of God's Word, you may as well. But here now, the Word of the Lord. Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 31. And they were bringing children to him, that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked, uh, rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them laying his hands on them. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And his disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. And God has blessings to his holy word. God's word is inerrant. It's infallible. It's all we need. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the sweetness of your word. Thank you that we can gather here. We can have this time now without interruption to look at your scriptures, see what you would have for us. Lord, please, please expose us. Please examine us. God, help us with, with your spirit. Show us what is the thing we lack? What, what is the thing, Lord, that you want us to give away? Father, we ask for mercy. God, I ask that you would help me not to say anything that's not of your word. Teach us now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. At one point or another, we've all tried to do the impossible. Usually it's on accident. You try to cook dinner, but it's impossible. Why? You forgot to buy chicken. That chicken's pretty expensive. Try to go on a road trip, but it's impossible. Why? You forgot to buy gas, right? Try to make coffee, it's impossible. Why? You forgot to buy beans. Or the cardinal sin of the South, you try to go hunting, but it's impossible. Why? You forgot bug spray. <laughs> Ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. You're going to get me out in the woods without bug spray. This morning in, in two back-to-back -back passages, we're told of what it takes to enter the kingdom of God. And Jesus makes it very clear that a man left to himself can't let enter the kingdom of God on his own. It's, in Jesus' own words, it's impossible. To enter the kingdom of God, Jesus says we need to be like who? 
children. What did he mean by that? Well, in, in verses 15 and 16, he both tells us and he shows us what he means by that. The kingdom of God is, is something that must be, he says, received. It must be received. Do you hear the passivity in, in that? The kingdom of God is, isn't something you earn, it's something you're what? You're given. It can't be bought, can't be earned. Okay, so what sort of attitude do I need to have in order to receive the kingdom? Well, what is the most obvious thing about children? It says we need to receive it like a child. What's the most obvious thing about children? We can't say children are pure. Those of you with two-year-olds know. True. It's not true. Maybe at one, but at two, no. We can't say children are all humble. I've seen children brag about how big a thing they can shove up their nose. So that's, that's not true. The universal factor that all children share is this. Children are all dependent. They're dependent. That's what Jesus is talking about. From the womb till the time they graduate and leave, and for some of them even past that, children are what? Dependent. They depend on their parents for life, to breathe, to eat, to learn, to understand discipline, to have maturity. Children are dependent. The attitude that receives the kingdom is a dependent attitude, an attitude that, that begs God for help and rescue. And then Jesus doesn't, even, just, doesn't just tell us that, he shows us that. In verse 16, he takes the children into his arms of his, of his own volition, and Jesus takes them and he puts his hands on them and he blesses them. Children can't bless themselves. He needs to bless them. This echoes back to John's gospel in the passage we read this morning, John 1.12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of who? God. So God has to, in other words, beloved, God has to do something in us then. Right? He has to make us like children. Another way Jesus put that in the Gospel of John was in John 3 3. He told Nicodemus what? He said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, and, or in another way, made like a child, right? He's not able to see the kingdom of God. In order to leave, right? We need to have faith in God, faith in His Son as the Savior of our souls. But, beloved, that faith, it's a dependent faith. That's what Jesus is trying to say here. It's a dependent faith. It's a faith that is dependent upon the Lord and on nothing that we bring, right? Otherwise, it's impossible. We've said this before. Mark is a super clever writer. He doesn't use the fanciest words. He, he doesn't give us all the little details all the time, but he is so clever. And remember, he's writing the first gospel, okay? And, and he, what he does here is he sets up a contrast. So while you have in your mind this picture of Jesus' arms wrapped around these children, these dependent children, and he's blessing them and putting his hands on them to bless them, while you have that in your minds, Mark sets up this picture. Now imagine this scene. Here comes this rich young man. And he comes up to Jesus and he says, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? A little bit of background. This story is in all three of what we call the synoptic gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those are the three gospels that are the most alike, right? It's in Matthew, it's in Mark, and it's in Luke. And it's because it's in all three that we call this guy the rich young ruler. You might notice that in the passage, he's not called the rich young ruler. But Matthew calls him young. Luke calls him a ruler. Point out that he's rich. That's why we call him the rich young ruler. And it starts off with that question. He runs up, he kneels before Jesus, gets on his knees, and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, if I ran up to one of you after church today, and before I asked you a question, I got on my knees, what would you think? Desperate? You're weird? Please get up? This is awkward? Or maybe, you're serious about this, aren't you? 
you. Whatever you're about to ask me, you are really serious about this. And that's what we can't call this into question. This man is genuinely serious about this question. We, we have to at least admit that. I don't think that he's not sincere. He's definitely sincere. And apparently he does want to do the right thing. What, where, he wants to go to heaven. That's kind of cool. Most people would just assume they're going to heaven. Yes, the average person on the street, are you going to heaven? They'll say, yeah, yeah I guess I am, right? At least he's thinking maybe he's not. And at, at the very least, we know that he thinks Jesus has the answer. He's not like the Pharisees we read about last week. He's not trying to trick Jesus. He genuinely thinks Jesus has the answer. But think about that question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Do you get the whiff of pretentiousness on that question? Pretentious is a funny word because pretentious sounds very pretentious, doesn't it? All right? But don't you get the whiff of that in that question? I, I, I think we got to look at this young man. we got to ask her a question. He's young... And he has money. Money. There's only two reasons that, isn't there? Number one, you already have an inheritance, right? That's probably what this is. He's probably already received an inheritance, and, and it's possible that now he's assuming, I'm owed more, right? I'm owed more. I inherited that. What do I have to do to inherit that? Here's another possibility. Maybe... Maybe he just worked really hard. You know, he's a ruler. In Luke, that probably means he's a ruler in a synagogue of, of some kind. Like he's a contributor. He's helped build. So maybe he's just working. Climbing, inventing something, we don't know. Right? But maybe he's just done that. And now he's arrogantly assuming, you know, I've climbed the ladder to get this far. The last rung is heaven. What do I need to do to get there? Again, eternal life is what? One prayer away. It's one chance away. All your good deeds tip the scales in your favor. You're good to go. That's not what the Bible says. But Jesus is full of mercy with this young man, isn't he? And he plays along and he answers. Verse 18, Jesus says, why do you call me good? I love that answer. That is totally ignoring his question and focusing on his address. Because he ran up and said, good teacher. And he's like, whoa, whoa, why do you call me good? I love that answer. When Jesus asked this, he is pulling the rug right out from underneath this young man. He might be pulling the rug out right out from underneath this young man. Love it, this is serious. Hear me. Do you believe that? Do you believe what Jesus just said? This isn't Paul. This is Jesus. And he says what? No one is good but God alone. And before I get to this point, I've got a better microphone that you guys need to, you guys need to hear. <laughs> no. Do you know what microphones are? Microphones are man-made machines that can and will fail. All right? If I was really bright, I'd bring this into a sermon illustration with what we're about to say. But anyway, here we go. Now, Jesus says what? No one is good except God alone. Beloved, most people in the world don't believe that. Most people in the world would believe what? Most people are inherently what? Good. There's possibly some of you here that actually do believe that. This isn't the only place in the Bible that says that. David in Psalm 51 verse 5, he says what? Surely I was sinful, not from birth, from conception. From conception. Paul in, in Romans chapter 3 verse 10, he, he puts it the most starkly. None is righteous. He doubles down. No, not one. 
No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. Listen to this. No one does good. Not even one. And this, is, this isn't even Paul's original words. He's quoting the Old Testament. In 1 Corinthians and in Romans, Paul says, in Adam we all die. We're all fallen in Adam. Even Solomon Wise Solomon, Ecclesiastes 7.20, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Beloved, the Bible never says men are inherently good. I, I know we hear that all the time. I know we like to have this positive, uplifting, hopeful, joyful attitude about humanity, the goodness of humanity. The Bible makes it really clear humanity doesn't have its own goodness. In fact, it goes out of its way in several different places to say the exact opposite. We call this the, to the, the doctrine of total depravity. Here, here's how the Westminster Confession, confession that we subscribe to, is just an, an interpretation of the theology of, of the Bible. It puts it this way, chapter 6. Our original corrupt nature completely disinclines, incapacitates, and turns us away from every good while it completely inclines us to every evil. From our corrupt nature proceed all actual sins. Now even as I quote all of this, all this scripture and stuff, there honestly, there might be some of us here, maybe someone watching or something that, that is saying in their hearts, no, I believe in, in the goodness of humanity. Beloved, Jesus didn't. He says very clearly, there's no one who's good except God alone. Here's an objection you'll hear. But I've seen unbelieving people do good things. Sure you have. We've all seen that. Pharaoh let the people go, didn't he? He did. That was a good thing. He let the people go. But when the people got across the Red Sea and they stopped, they didn't look back and start singing Pharaoh's praises, did they? Pharaoh was dead in the sea. What did they do? They sung and worshipped God. Why? Because they understood something. Yeah, Pharaoh let them go. That was a good thing. That was a good thing that God did through an evil man. Amen? Amen. It's just like with Joseph, right? Joseph, in, uh, uh, when he's talking to his brothers, his brothers who sold him into slavery, what does he say at the end of the book? What does he say? What you intended for what? Evil, God intended for good. This is, what, this is what we call the common grace of God, beloved. This is God does very good things. In fact, James puts it this way. Every good thing comes down from the Father. God will do very good things even through evil men, even through us. And beloved, I, I harp on this because this is important. This is where repentance starts. With the children, Jesus is teaching us, you must be dependent. With the rich young ruler, Jesus is teaching us, you must be repentant. That's the faith that inherits the eternal kingdom, that inherits the eternal life. We must be dependent and we must be repentant. If I'm not convinced that God alone is wholly good and I'm not, then I'm not going to go to him for repentance. I'm not going to come to God and repent. I'm just not going to do it. Why? Because, beloved, dependence. The reason repentance is important is because of dependence. If I think there's good in me, am I going to depend on the Lord? No, I'm going to depend on who? Me. But if I'm convinced without a shadow of a doubt, like what Paul says in Romans 17 and Romans 7:18. Nothing good dwells within me, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. If I know that, if I completely believe that, then who am I going to depend on? God, and only God. So you see what Jesus is doing here. He, he's pulling the rug out from underneath this young man's feet. He's landing flat on his back, and Jesus is forcing his eyes heavenward so he can look at God and stare into the glory of God and realize, boy, God is good and you're not. You came up here walking up to me thinking you're good and you're not. That's the first thing this young man needs to understand. We need to reckon with that first. That's where repentance starts. 
Next, Jesus says, don't you know the commandments? In, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus puts it this way. He says, keep the commandments. That's what you got to do. You got to keep the commandments. I love that in Matthew's gospel, Jesus says, keep the commandments. And you know what the young man's reply is? Which ones? <laughs> I love that. When I, when I was a kid, my, my dad one day, one morning, he said, hey, John, I, I want you to wash the vehicles today. Now, my mom had this little white coupe, and my dad had two trucks. He had a, like a Ford F-250 with an extended cab, and then he had a GMC flatbed work truck. And I hated washing those trucks. So I washed the car, and I put a little soap on the front of one of the trucks. And my dad came home, and, and he said, why are my trucks not washed? <laughs> and I said, well, you didn't specify which ones, Dad. And that was a mistake. We'll just, <laughs> we'll just put it that way. <laughs> we'll just put it that way. James 2, chapter, or James chapter 2, verse 10. If we are guilty of breaking one part of the law, then we have broken what? All of the law. You know, God's law is not a grading system. It's pass-fail. And guess what we've all done? Failed. we failed. You either keep it or you break it, and we have broken it. So, so Jesus kind of plays along with this young man, and he plays a little further, and, and he lists some of the commandments. He knows this, this young man has not kept all the commandments, but he lists them. He, he basically lists the right side of the law. He says, don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't lie, honor your mom and dad. But then he says an interesting one. He says, don't defraud. Did you guys catch that? That's not one of the commandments. Well, it is. It, it's Deuteronomy 24, verse 14, it, which is a commandment not to oppress or defraud the poor. And I think Jesus threw that one in there to kind of get at the heart of this young man I think he's trying to pinpoint the idol in this young man's heart, but the man doesn't pick up on it because his reply is hilarious. All these I have kept since my youth. So Jesus just said, you know, only God is good. And this young man basically replies, me too. Me too. In response to this, Jesus gives a really difficult task to this young man. Please notice, please notice this. The, these are hard words that Jesus is about to say, but the text says that he looks at the man and what? Loves him. Jesus is saying this in love. Remember that. Remember that. So how does Jesus show love for this rich, young, arrogant, but sincere man who just wants to have eternal life? Jesus says, you lack one thing. You lack one thing. Go, verse 21, go sell all that you have, give to the poor, then you'll have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. Beloved, so Many churches today would look at what Jesus just said and say, you blew it. You just blew it. Are you kidding me? Jesus, that's too much. You can't demand that of him. This guy, he just wants in. Would you let him in? Jesus, he's rich. You realize he could tithe like one time and we'd have a new building? What are you doing? Don't tell him to sell all that blessing and giving away. Like, tell him to give it. Let Jesus, he's a seeker. We need to be sensitive to him. Let's meet his needs first. Right? Jesus, if you really loved this young man, you would not say something so difficult that it would make him walk away. You wouldn't say that if you loved him. If you loved him, you would just accept him as he is. Beloved, God loves us too much to accept us as we are. To leave us as we are. That's why we have to be what? Born again. Proverbs 27, 6. If you haven't memorized this, memorize this. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. There's no better friend than Jesus. But many are the kisses of an enemy. A church that tells you exactly what you want to hear to make you feel comfortable is your enemy. Many are the kisses of an enemy. 
Beloved, if God's word ever pierces you and exposes some kind of sin, maybe God's word does that today. If a brother or sister ever comes up to you and from God's word shows you that something you're doing is an error, something you're doing is wrong. Beloved, hear me. Listen, don't you dare say, this is God oppressing me. This is the church oppressing me. Right here in this text, That is God loving you. With love, Jesus tells this young man, you need to sell everything and give it to the poor. That's God's love, not his oppression, not his hate to point out our idols and to point out our sin. Jesus could read this young man's heart and he knew, yeah, he's sincere, he's sincere, but he loves money more than he's ever going to love me. Yeah, he wants to go to heaven, but he loves money more than he ever is going to love me. So because I love him, I'm going to tell him really what he needs to do in order to repent. For a moment, just for a moment, pause. Let's make this about ourselves. If you came up to Jesus, maybe you prayed to Jesus today, and you said, Lord, what thing do I lack? Let me ask you a question. What would God shine the spotlight on? What would God shine the spotlight on? What idolatry would he confront? What thing is your heart gripping onto that Jesus would point and say, give me that? What's the thing? Think about it. Here's another lesson here about repentance. Repentance. Repentance is not, this is important, repentance is not becoming more godly. Notice this, Jesus does not ask the young man to become a better man. That's not what he's saying. That's not what repentance is. We we often think that repentance is I, I turn from my evil work, right, to a better work. Right, So repentance is like, I turn from lying or cheating or anger, and now I'm going to be honest. I'm going to own up to my mistakes. I'm going to be patient. That's not repentance. But we think that's repentance. It's not. I once heard repentance described as this. It's living like you want to get into heaven. No. Repentance is living like I know God is my only hope of ever getting into heaven. That's repentance. Yes, repentance is turning away from my sins, but it's also turning away from my accomplishments. Hear me. Repentance is also turning away from my accomplishments. Right? Especially if I think those accomplishments are are going to somehow merit the favor of God. So repentance is I turn away from my sin, but I don't turn to the sin of of self-righteousness and say, now that I'm living this, I'm good with God. That's not what repentance is. What is repentance? Repentance is I turn from my failures and I turn from my accomplishments and I look to God and I recognize what Jesus just said, only God is good. That's repentance. Jesus is not asking this young man to come be better. He's asking him to no longer be a rich man, but instead to be a beggar. Be a beggar. Be dependent. He needs to come to Jesus, and we all need to come to Jesus with our hands empty. Charles Wesley put it the best. Rock, the hymn, Rock of Ages, If I had thought ahead, I would have told you, let's sing that today. I'm sorry. All right? But nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. That's repentance, beloved. That is exactly what repentance is. And what is this rich young ruler's response? He leaves full of sorrow. Why is he full of sorrow? The text says because he had great possessions and one of those possessions was not Jesus. That's why he's full of sorrow. Now why doesn't he want Jesus? Because he doesn't. He doesn't want Jesus. 
He did not want to hear that Jesus is the only one who's good. What he wanted to hear is that he was good too. He wanted to be good all on his own. We can't do that. Now Jesus, he, he doesn't miss the opportunity. He closes with a lesson for his disciples. Verse 25, it's kind of a hilarious lesson. He says, is it, it is easier for a camel, can you picture this, to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. That's just a hilarious image, isn't it? That's the whole point. Beloved, here's the hard part. Are you ready? We need to remember this. Every single one of us in this room is rich. Some of you are like, nah, some of us are rich. No, beloved, listen. Comparative to the world, we are beyond wealthy. Unless you just walked in here a homeless person, you are rich. You are rich. We are the 1% of the world, beloved. It, it, that's just a fact of numbers. We are. We are rich. We are all camels this morning. No offense. We have much to distract us from Jesus. We have much to place over him. We have all, everything in our lives begs for our attention away from him. All of us could order a million idols on Amazon today and they'd be on our doorsteps tomorrow. I know sixth graders that have a thousand dollar phone in their pocket and all they do is watch TikTok on it. That is the epitome of rich. Beloved, is salvation possible for us? Here's Jesus' words. No. No. Would any of us really leave all of that to cling to Jesus? This is the point. No. Left to ourselves, no, we wouldn't. We need the Spirit's help to do that. That's why Jesus' closing words are so filled with hope. He says, with man, this is impossible. But with God, what? All things are possible. With God, even the richest young ruler, the richest fool that thinks he's perfect, could be humbled by the Spirit and actually trust in the Lord. That's amazing grace. It's not amazing if you've got to earn it or you've got to figure it out, or you've got to buy it. It's only amazing if God does it. By the way, this is not a parable. This is not a story Jesus is telling to try and teach us a lesson. Beloved, this young man, there is a really a young man who really did approach Jesus. Jesus really did tell him, go and sell everything. That's the idol in your heart. And this young man really did walk away. And don't miss this, beloved. Jesus really did not go after him. He really didn't. This is why Hebrews 3.15 says, today, if you hear his voice, what? Do not harden your hearts. Beloved, beloved, hear me. If today God is showing you something, confronting something in your life, exposing some idol and saying, get rid of that, sell that, give that to me, listen to me, repent. Don't, don't hold on to that. Let it go. Let it go so you can say like the hymn, simply to the cross I cling. And by the way, if you do that, you will not regret it. Here, Peter in verse, 18, or verse 28, he says, we've left everything and followed you. Jesus says, anyone who follows me will gain back a hundredfold whatever it costs them to be my disciple. And, and by the way, Jesus says, get this, we'll receive back a hundredfold, he says, in this time. In this time. M meaning now. Like in this life. Does that mean if I follow Jesus and sell everything, I'm going to get rich? That's not what he means. Jesus promises we're going to have family. If you leave all of your home, all of your family, all of your land and come follow him, Jesus will give all of that back to you. How does he do that? Beloved, that's obvious. Look around. This is how he does that. What do we get in this life when we follow Christ? You don't just get the hope of eternal life. You get each other. 
You get brothers and sisters and new mothers and new fathers and new children and homes and land and all of it. You get the church. There is no more amazing gift here on this life than that right there. It's immeasurable, the blessing of the church. When I was 15, I became a Christian. I I, I had friends and, and family that I loved very dearly, but there was something that did become obvious in the years to come. I lost some of them. I mean, I've got friends that that I thought I was going to be friends with forever. I don't even get invited to their weddings. I just lost them. But you know what I gained? Beloved, I have fathers in Christ who have taught me all my life. I have mothers in Christ that have prayed for me and helped me and showered me with love. I've got brothers and sisters that have sat with me in the darkest times when family members wouldn't. I've even, I don't have any children. I've got children in Christ. You know one of the blessings of doing youth ministry for over 10 years? This is amazing. I still get choked up thinking about this. I saw sixth graders that I got to disciple They graduated, got married, and some of them to this day are still my best friends. If the Edwards are watching, love you guys. Sixth graders. You can have children in Christ. Think about that. And here's the blessing of the body. Sarah and I can leave our family in Florida. We can leave church families in Florida that mean the world to us and come here. And honestly, beloved, we feel like we're getting a stronger bond with y'all than anyone we've ever met before. You will not regret leaving everything, leaving everyone, selling everything to follow the Lord. You won't. Not in this life. And that's just now. Because in the life to come, that's eternal life. That's even better. Believe me, you won't regret a thing if you sell everything to follow the Lord. So here, here's the question. The question is, what do you want? The question is, what do you want? Do you want to be the rich young ruler clinging onto possessions, the security blanket of money, or, or whatever it is? Or do you want to be one of those children wrapped up in Jesus' arms with nothing in your arms to bring. Covered in his blessings. I want to be one of the children. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the grace that we have even now in this life, each other getting to know each other, love each other, be surrounded, supported by one another so that your, your word says that none of us are in need. Thank you, Father, for the church. And God, thank you for the hope and the promise of eternal life. Lord, help us. Make us dependent. Whatever it takes, God. Whatever it takes. Show us the thing we lack. Show us the idol. Show us whatever it is that needs to be thrown away, handed over. Oh, God, make us dependent and make us repentant because you are worth it all. Show us what, what kind of a treasure Christ is. Make him so valuable in our eyes, Lord, please. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, we need to change.